Okay, hi everyone. I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for coming to this panel discussion, Bridging Language Divides, the Role of Translators in Supporting Diverse Acquisitions. My name is Lauren Edwards, and I'm the Translation Program Manager at Amazon Crossing. Amazon Crossing is the imprint for literature and translation at Amazon Publishing. And since 2010, we've translated more than 900 books into five languages from 39 countries and 22 languages. I'm very pleased today to be joined by the three translators sitting next to me. We'll begin with just a brief round of introductions starting with Nikki here to my left. Nikki Harmon was co-chair of the UK Translators Association from 2014 to 2017. She translates full-time from Chinese, focusing on fiction, literary nonfiction, and occasionally poetry. She also translated Happy Dreams by Jia Pinghua, which was published by Amazon Crossing. She gives regular talks and workshops on translation, and along with Eric Abrahamson, Dave Haysom, and Helen Wang, she runs the Read Paper Republic project, posting and promoting free to view short stories translated from Chinese. Thanks so much for being here, Nikki. Okay, next up we have Antonia Lloyd Jones. Hello. <laughs> Antonia is the, a prize winning translator of Polish literature. She has translated works by many of Poland's leading contemporary novelists and authors of reportage, as well as crime fiction, poetry, screenplays, essays, and children's books. She is a mentor for the WCN Emerging Translator Mentorship Program, and from 2015 to 2017, she was co-chair of the UK Translators Association. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Sawad Hussein. Sawad is an Arabic translator and literateur who is passionate about all things related to Arabic culture, history, and literature. She has regularly critiqued Arabic literature and translation for Arab Lit and Asymptote, among others. She was the co-editor of the Arabic-English portion of the seminal, award-winning Oxford Arabic Dictionary, released in 2014. And her most recent translated work is a Jordanian sci-fi novel, published in 2017. She is currently working on a Kuwaiti historical fiction novel by the 2013 International Prize of Arabic fiction winner, Saud al-Sanusi, and will then translate a Palestinian resistance classic by Sahar Khalife. She holds an MA in Modern Arabic Literature from the School of Oriental and African Studies. Thank you all so much for being here. Great. Well, to begin today, each of the panelists have prepared just a few thoughts to share with the group. So we'll, we'll begin with that and then from there move into a moderated discussion. So I think, Antonia, you wanted to go first? Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to our panel. Um, what I'm going to say will probably be obvious for some of you. but. Um, the three of us translate from what sometimes rather annoyingly get called minority languages. <laughs> I, I hate that phrase, but we're kind of stuck with it. But what it means in effect for a translator is that we can't sit and wait for the phone to ring. I'm frightfully envious of all our colleagues who translate from Spanish and French and so on and just get commissions all the time and don't even have to read a book before they translate it. <laughs> because we have to make these things happen. So, in effect, if you're translating from a lesser known language, uh, you have to act as what's sometimes called an ambassador on behalf of that literature. And in effect, what that means is that you have to remember that it's much harder for publishers to know that anything about that literature and to read those books themselves. So, you've got to do a lot of the running for them. And also, the countries that we're translating from often don't have a developed agent system. So there aren't agents running around doing all that scouting and promoting and pitching. So as a translator, you have to be proactive. And um, the first thing really to do is to find a damn good book that you feel very strongly about that ought to go into English. And that's really that's the most important thing of all. And if you're going to have to persuade somebody to publish a book which you, you want to translate, then you've got to feel very strongly about that book yourself or you won't be convincing. So the first thing you need to do is know what's being published in that country or what hasn't appeared in English before. Find something you feel extremely strongly about. And then what you also have to do, this happened to me with a, recently with a, a book that was such a weird, I mean, we're talking about diverse acquisitions is the phrase used here. I found a book written by a Ukrainian woman in Polish. I mean, how easy is that going to be to sell to British publishers? 
And, um, but I completely fell in love with the book. I love the style, I love the story, I love the setting, I love the characters. But it's an extremely complex book with a great deal of historical background in it, uh, lots of complication and, and very difficult language. So it's like a really difficult pitch and um, took on a lot. So then the next thing you have to do is prepare some extremely good material about the book. And my own method is to prepare a book report which includes a very detailed summary of the book, but concise as well as detailed, which is actually a great deal more work than it sounds to prepare. And then an assessment of the book saying why I love it so much and why I think it's got a chance on the British or American market. And then, I've, obviously, you prepare some samples, you translate some pieces from the book, but you've got to choose exactly the right pieces that really show what that book is and that are going to hold a publisher's attention. You have to keep remembering what a publisher's job must be like. They're being bombarded with books and ideas all the time. Your thing has to stand out somehow. Um, and then, so the quality of your materials is very important. And then the next thing to do is not simply send those out to any publisher and bombard the publishing world with your marvelous idea. You've got to do a bit of research of publishers, study their websites, try to understand who's publishing what and which editors might like what you have to offer. Try and target your pitch. And that's actually quite difficult. It's like going for a job interview. You find out something about the company that's interviewing you. You don't just go in there blind. And it's exactly the same. If, if you can show a publisher that you've actually thought about what they're looking for, that's going to make a very big difference to, to how they receive you. Um, and then the other thing is that you have to be extremely persistent. So um, with this particular... I've had cases where... Um, I've had to take a book to more than 20 different publishers over a period of 10 years sometimes before I've had a book accepted. And you have to not give up. And sometimes if a book's rejected by a publisher, it's worth asking them, well, why? Why is, does this not suit you? And they may have some very personal reason. But if you know, if you're given reasons why your pitch was rejected, you can go back to the drawing board. You can improve your materials. You can improve your pitch. Always remember that, that don't give up. I mean, just keep improving what you're presenting and try again. So um, I haven't really given you a proper example, but with the Ukrainian woman's book, it did work. A bit of persistence paid off, and I actually only had to pitch it to, to three publishers before I was successful with it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Sawad, do you want to go ahead and share your thoughts? Yes, sure. Can you hear me? No. Can you press it? Try again. Oh, is it working now? Hello? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Sorry. So when I was kindly asked by Lauren to speak on this panel and answer the question of how does the translator advise and influence the editor in their acquisition process, I broke it down into four points. So I'm going to be speaking about, and a lot of them actually Antonia has already kindly touched upon, but I'm going to relate them to my experience as an Arabic translator specifically. Uh, so I'm going to be starting with translator preparation, getting your hands on the book, which is very difficult in Arabic at times, uh, pitching to the publishing house, and managing author expectations and communication, which also falls upon um, me as an Arabic translator, and I'm sure as you as well as translators of minority languages. So what do I mean by translator preparation? I mean choosing the right book as well as situating it within the literary landscape. So you need to be a voracious reader, not only in your source language, but the target language as well. And keep up to date on literary trends in which releases have garnered the attention of award committees or the general public, or ideally both. Arabic specifically, unfortunately, doesn't have a strong culture of reviews in print media. And so most reviews online, which the ones that are online, are just a blurb of the book 
maybe a quote from the book and then a three-line summary. So you're not really getting much about the novel. So the way I keep up to date with books that I might be interested in is there's a really rich culture of book vlogging on YouTube. Um, a lot of Arab youth are really into reviewing books on YouTube. Um, TV programs where authors are invited to discuss their recent releases. So I watch a lot of TV programs from the UAE, Jordan, and Egypt in particular, which have a really strong um, literary presence on TV. Uh, also following the Twitter feeds of authors who you like and trying to keep an eye out on what are they reading, what are their recommendations as well as attending literary festivals in the Middle East. I would highly recommend the Emirates Lit Fest, the Cairo Book Fair, the Abu Dhabi Book Fair. Um, it's a really good place to keep an eye out for new authors as well as finding you know, books that you might want to learn a bit more about. With regards to getting your hands on the book, so I have never received a book from an Arab publisher. Uh, I've always had to contact the author and ask for either an electronic PDF or, um, yeah, actually it's always the author. And so for me, the key thing is getting the author's contact details, which is either via Twitter or Facebook, or I have to give a shout out to Marsha from the Arab Lit blog, if you translate from Arabic. She has been instrumental in connecting me to a lot of the authors I've worked with in the past or I'm currently working with. So the key thing is to have their contact details. So you have the book, you've read it, you love it, and now you're pitching it. So as Antonia was saying, that you need to, I would highly recommend reading at least two to three books from the publishing house that you're planning on pitching to. So that not only can you situate the book within the source language, but also in the target language and then within their sphere of their reading list, right? So you would say, oh, my project, I think the tone is res reminiscent of this author, you know, you have, and the writing style has a dash of X with Z etc. so that they also can cling on to something, right? Because you're pitching them something completely foreign and they need to familiarize it with what they know. Um, lastly, I would want to talk about author expectations and communication. As a translator from a language which isn't supported by literary agents, uh, you have to take control of the communication and manage author's expectations with regards to deadlines, what is translation. A lot of Arab authors can read in English, but it's different in terms of being able to read in English and actually judge if a work is of quality. And so you're having to explain why you made certain choices um, to them, etc., because the editor can't explain to them in Arabic why we you know, cut out two paragraphs or change the character's name or something. And lastly, yeah, I mean, that also includes um, filling out publicity paperwork on their behalf at times I've had to do where they'll send something to me in Arabic and I have to translate it into English, as well as communicating questions from the editor to the author themselves. So the pluses of having to have this extra role as a translator is that you develop a very rich working relationship with the author, which might not happen in other languages. I'm not very sure but then the downfall is that it's a lot of time and you don't get paid for it so a lot of my communication is by voice uh, whatsapp messages with my authors or by email um, but I have found it to be extremely rewarding in doing that but it's just something you need to be ready for if you're working with a language that doesn't have a literary agent of the authors I've worked with only one has been represented by a literary agent which is the one I'm actually translating <laughs> for Amazon Crossing and it's been a very different experience because I'm only contacting him for questions and he's not coming to me with a whole bunch of questions because he's asking the agent and so I can focus on the translation which has been a bit different yeah Great, and yeah, that's all I have to say. Okay, yeah. great, thank you Thanks. so much, Sawad. Um, and Nikki, what are your thoughts? Um, well, I, I actually asked to go last. <laughs> <laughs> because I thought that, uh, really, I'm probably the least successful in, in pitching to publishers. My favorite books never seem to be publishers' favorite books. But once I started to think, I actually thought of a few examples where I had successfully found a publisher. So here goes. So um, the Jia Pinghua novel, Happy Dreams, that Lauren mentioned that uh, was published 
by Amazon Crossing. I actually spotted that book. It was eight years before a publisher popped up. And I can't take credit for finding Amazon, you found me. But what I did do, having failed dismally to find a publisher eight years previously, was to get an excerpt published on the Guardian newspaper. And it was that that um, one of the Amazon editors spotted. And uh, then she traced me back to Paper Republic, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, so good things come to those that wait, as the Guinness advert says. <laughs> Um, and also, da -da -da -da, this one, about to come out, um, Ballastia Press, a novel by Yen Ge called, yes, all right, here we go, <laughs> The Chili Bean Pace Clan, was another one that I fell in love with, and no luck for ages, but when Ballastia and I got together and they said that they would publish it. It actually helped a lot that I could point them in the direction of uh, the Pen Translate grant. So another, another hot tip is if you can find uh, for a publisher some, some support or an indication of where they might get funding for the translation, that helps a lot. It doesn't go all the way, but it certainly goes part of the way. Um, so, yeah, so as I said, I regarded myself as a more or less complete failure, but when I totted it up, I found that I had found publishers for five books, three novels, of which that one is one, one book of poetry, and um, one non-fiction sociology. Uh, and I did it by the tried and tested method, so nothing much to add to that, because um, you've both talked in, in detail. It does take a long time. It does sometimes work. When it works, it's wonderful. Um, I think one more thing I would say about this whole process of finding a publisher is that there's also the, the drip drip method. And that is where you do work as we do on Paper Republic, where we have a website run by a collective of translators where we blog actively about our favorite authors, our favorite books. We put samples up there, translated. We put our own biogs up there. And a number of translators, uh, of publishers, have come to me through my translators page on Paper Republic, and we run complete short stories. Why is it the drip drip effect? Because it may take a very long time. We're not specifically pitching um, a particular novel. It just is a way of making publishers, as with the general public, aware that there are writers out there that they might like to read more of and bit, be a bit more interested in. The last thing I was going to say was a bright idea I had. I have no idea what other publishers think about this, but it does sometimes feel like finding a needle in a haystack to match your favorite author or your favorite book with an interested publisher. And it occurred to me that publishers, as we know, often feel harassed by translators um, who are desperate to get their favorite books published. Might it not be a good idea for publishers who have an afternoon spare to invite in uh, a small group of translators and have a brainstorming session? And that this might actually be a nice way to make friends with publishers and for them to make friends with interested translators. It doesn't mean that you don't still have to do the spade work, but it might just be a way to get to know what direction a publisher thinks they're going in, what kind of things they might be interested in. Uh, I mean, I've had publishers say to me something that I find on the whole deeply unhelpful, which is bring me the latest Chinese Dan Brown or Nordic Noir Chinois, <laughs> um, which just doesn't happen. 
but a kind of brainstorming session appeals to me. Uh, and this could be done, I suppose, on Skype, but it would be really nice if it was also city-based, so you could get a bunch of people together in London. And it only need be one publisher with a couple of editors and maybe three, four, five translators from different languages. Uh, so I throw that idea out there. <laughs> all right. I love that idea. <laughs> Well, great. Thank you all. And I, I have to say, as I'm sitting here listening to you, it's really interesting to me to hear so much commonality between all of your different experiences, even though you work in different languages with different markets. Um, and I just, you know, I kind of wanted to ask a little more about that question of which titles, which authors to pitch. You all mentioned finding a book that you love and feeling passionate about. Um, but with such a wealth of literature, I wonder, do you have strategies around focusing in on one genre or one author? Um, you know, how, how do you take this wide world that you're working in of, of this language and kind of narrow down your pitches? I can, can, I, can I say something? Um, I was very pleased to hear the others flesh out my very general comments earlier. <laughs> and um, something that occurred to me while they were talking is that the pitch you make for different genres is going to be completely different. Yeah. Um, and Lauren just, just mentioned that. I was just thinking about my own experience of getting poetry books published. And you need a totally other strategy for that. So if you're trying to get a book of poetry out there, you have to spend some years publishing individual poems by that author in journals to build up some kind of existence for that author in the English-speaking world. And it can take a long time. That's a drip, drip, drip method, if ever there was one. And then when you reach a stage where you feel perhaps there's enough material for a book, um, most poetry publishers will say on their websites how they expect pitches to be put together. They want a certain number of poems, but not more. And they only accept pitches between, I don't know, Thursday the 3rd of February and <laughs> Sunday the 18th of <laughs> August, and God knows why. I suppose they're on holiday the rest of the time, on all the money they make out of all that poetry. But um, it's a good idea if you pitch a poetry book to have the whole book ready but only give them the bit they want, but have everything ready immediately. Because if they do want to see more, give them the lot at that point. Um, so it's a quite different approach from, from uh, um, pitching novels. And then again, I was thinking how pitching children's books is another whole ball game. And I've recently been kind of learning the hard way with that. I've been doing a mentorship with Sosha Krasadomska jones who's just sitting over there. And she's been working on children's books. We've both learned such a lot about the expectations of British and American publishers when it comes to children's books, which are totally different from European children's books. And um, we keep having to alter our pitch as we learn by going, well, we went to the Bologna Book Fair and just talked to people and found out we were doing everything completely wrong. So you can just keep learning and keep changing. <laughs> Absolutely. Good. Well, I, I think what you said, Antonia, absolutely bears out my point that we need to learn as translators as much as possible about how publishers uh, go for their particular area of interest. Uh, as regards genre, Chinese is a particularly naughty problem because their <laughs> genre on the whole are not our genre. So it, it's very difficult to find a kind of match. Sci-fi, actually sci-fi uh, now goes down pretty well. Chinese sci-fi is beginning to really make a name for itself in translation. Um, and also martial arts fiction has a brave new future, we think, um, with a new book what translated is that? by... <laughs> oh, Ask Anna Homewood has just... Uh, Macaulay's <laughs> Press. Yeah. I've just published a, a great big martial arts book. Um, but, yeah, I, I think I'll take a break at this point point. think what else I want to say. Over to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I guess I just wanted to say, in my experience, I've never really had a publisher come to me and say that they want something specific for Arabic. It's kind of just like, well, what do you have? Like, you know, just tell us what you're reading. And so it's really just about books that I enjoy and that, you know, I've noticed that other people are also enjoying. I tend to focus primarily on women's fiction just because that's what I like to translate and that's what I connect to. So. I kind of approach it a different way. So I find a book that I like, then I research publishers and look at their lists and think about, okay, could this fit in there? Is there something on that list that looks similar to my book? Um, and that's how I would, yeah, go yeah. about it. Excellent. You know, on the, on the side of the publisher, I can say um, samples can play a really important, helpful role in, mm -hmm. in us understanding what a book is. Um, and as a room full of translators, I was interested to get into kind of the nitty gritty of samples of, you know, you mentioned a reader report, Antonia, or publishing an excerpt. Um, in general, do you, do you have a standard approach? Do you translate the beginning, the middle, the end? Do you do a reader's report? What have, what have you found to be most effective? Um. Yeah, a, a, a kind of reader's report, definitely, of one sort or another. But I, I think it's quite fair to, to cheat with samples. Choose the best bit of the book. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, it's difficult. <laughs> I'm just going to say, if it starts slowly, and a lot of Chinese books do start slowly, maybe you just skip to the next more <laughs> gripping bit. <laughs> it's very difficult, actually. I do think it's important to choose your samples very carefully and to think what do these samples tell you about this book? And I suppose I'm usually, I, I just desperately was working even yesterday doing some samples for a publisher for this book fair. And uh, it was a book written in three sections, so I thought, okay, I'll pick a sample out of each section of the book, because they're all slightly different. And so I've got, you know, two days to get these samples done. Halfway through sample number two, I thought, nah, this sample's all wrong. <laughs> it's completely wrong. It's going to bore them to tears. So I started again, which is why I was up at six this morning. <laughs> but um, you, you do need to choose them carefully. And sometimes when you're working on a sample, you do realize that it's wrong, but it isn't going to work. And then you've got to stop and find a different sample and make sure it's right. And, and I try to choose ones that tell you something about the style of the book, tell you something about the plot and the characters, leave you with a cliffhanger so you want to go on reading more. Really try and think, what's really going to interest some poor old publisher who's got millions of these things to read? You've got to somehow find a sample that covers all the bases, that really attracts them to that book. Great. I think Antonia has said it all. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, really good. Yeah, you're yeah. so right. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. You know, um, a lot of times when you talk about underrepresented languages, that also means we're talking about um, underrepresented cultures, for lack of a better phrase. You know, languages and cultures that editors might have little to no understanding of. Um, when you go about pitching, how do you then contextualize who this author is or what this title is within this, this culture where the editor has no prior knowledge? Yeah, so I think um, I'll just refer back to um, what I had said earlier in terms of contextualizing it within, so for me, like the Arab literary landscape, right? So this is a Palestinian resistance novel, so what? What's unique about it? It's told from, you know, a feminine point of view and about the role of females in the first intifada, which actually hasn't been detailed before in English, right? So that's how I went about pitching this book that I will now be working on. Um, afterwards with a different publisher once I finish my book with Amazon Crossing. You know, if you're working on the book that I'm currently working on is Gulf historical fiction, what's so interesting or different about that? As in, you have to really contextualize it in the sense, how are Arab readers responding to it? Why is it different? And what, how do you think an English reader will respond to it? Um, a lot of the times, yes, you know, we're dealing with uh, publishers who don't really have knowledge of maybe historical events in the Middle East and how that's impacting, you know, present day writing trends or themes. And you, I just kind of informally give extra information. It's not in the report, but I'll put it in the email just saying that, oh, this book, you know, is really important because of X, Y, Z. Um, but I don't usually put it in the report, but I definitely do give that sort of context in the email. And they might already know it, but I just assume that they don't. 
because you know just to give extra padding I guess yeah yeah, uh, yeah I mean I, I think this is really it's quite a complicated issue uh, China has had a turbulent history in the last hundred or so years <coughs> Chinese contemporary Chinese authors are very preoccupied by various political movements that have happened and the effect on the lives of their themselves as young people, their parents, their grandparents, and, and so on, in, including the Cultural Revolution, but many other things as well. You can't expect the publisher to know all these things. On the other hand, if you have to give your favored publisher a history lesson, that book is probably not going to work. The book has to work for the general reader because that's who the publisher is going to sell it to. Um, so I think you have to think through that quite carefully. Uh, I mean, I'm about to start work on a book by, I think, a, a really brilliant um, author in his 40s in China. I'm doing it for the the Chinese publisher who will then hope to sell the rights or whatever, pass the rights over to a Western publisher. And, and it, it is about this period of starvation between 1958 and 1961. I don't know how much information the publisher will need. Uh, in my view, because I think it's a brilliant book, they won't need very much. It will be clear as you go through and there'll be enough contemporary resident resonances that, that uh, as a translator I won't feel the need to to explain very much but you know ask me again this time next year I think this book works in its own right I really hope it does um, we'll see yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would just add two little things one is that um, I do try to play out the universal aspects of the book, the human level of the book, because of course there's going to be all sorts of historical stuff that, that non-poles, in my case, won't know. But um, one piece of context that publishers absolutely love is called sales figures. <laughs> and uh, you can usually get a publisher <laughs> to sit up if you can tell them how many copies of a book have been sold in its own country. It's always worth finding that out. Um, and then, of course, you mentioned earlier, you mentioned this earlier, but they, they like you to try and compare it with something familiar to them, which is a nightmare if you, if you know a book well. You, it's not like anything. I mean, how can it be like anything else? It, why, why, would it, why would you bother writing it if it already existed? But they always like it if you can come up with some rather, something that sounds terribly naff to you, but <laughs> this is the latest, you know, whatever, Kurt Vonnegut or something. It doesn't matter if it is... <laughs> Really? Yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, you know, many of you have touched on this already, but I was hoping to hear more about the role of the author through this whole process. You know, how do you engage with the author during pitching? And then, you know, if there is interest or even ac an acquisition, is it the role of the translator to, to be that bridge between the acquiring editor and the author and help them develop a business relationship? Um, so while it sounds like you're very involved, I'm curious, Antonia and Nikki, what, what has your experience been there? And so I'll obviously feel free to expand. <laughs> um, yes, I, I love my authors, but I don't try and set them up with business deals because whenever I have, we've both ended up with empty pockets. Um, I feel they've really got to take responsibility for their own business deals. Um, but yes, introductions, um, liaising between them and the publisher, I'll do that if necessary. That can be very time consuming and involve translating loads of emails, which I'm not really keen on doing if I can avoid it, but sometimes it's necessary. Uh, once the contract has been signed, then I really love my authors because then I can do lots of discussing with them on email about why they've done this and that and, and so on. So I, I try to be as helpful as possible. Uh, it's not easy. I work very closely with my authors as long as they're alive, that is. And some of them inconveniently <laughs> insist on being dead. But um, so... Um, 
they're very useful also for pitching. So for instance, I've published two books with Amazon Crossing with an author who happens to be very good looking and attractive and generally a, a good sell. So I'm always, I was talking to our commissioning editor only this morning saying how I make him go and run around the block and keep his figure and <laughs> look good. <laughs> um, but um, in, in fact, the thing to say that's much more relevant about him is that, particularly with one of his books, we realized that the way it had been published in Poland wasn't going to work in English. So I worked with him to edit the book before I translated it with a view to the different language market. And then at Amazon Crossing it was further edited and I think the result is very good. But that's one way an author can contribute to making his book work. It may not, it may not work exactly as it was writ originally written and a translator can help and work with an author to make a book a bit more suitable to the target market. Yeah. I just wanted to say with regards to the role of the author, I think there are different views on this, but whenever I do a sample, as common courtesy, I send it to the author before I pitch it. Um, I know there's some translate. I'm not sure if, if you do that, um, but I've always Sometimes. done that and some, I mean, most of the time it's like thank you this looks great and sometimes they also come back with like why did you choose this or how about changing the sentence and actually it's resulted in a more fruitful um, sample but that I think is because from the start I'm aware I'm gonna have to have a working relationship with this author if the book does get picked up so we try to establish that from the beginning that I do want their input um, you know Yes, yeah. yeah. It helps if they know English. Publishers like to know that an author speaks English because they like them to appear at festivals. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to yeah, sorry, point out that sometimes even if they don't know English, they like to get a friend who speaks English to read the sample on their behalf. I've also had that happen because a lot of the times, yeah, they, they don't um, speak English. Or they do, but don't feel comfortable assessing quality of literary translation in a different language. And also if they don't speak English, you can say that you'll interpret for them at, at literary festivals if you're feeling brave. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. You know, on a, a related note, you already talked about contextualizing the book itself, maybe introducing the author, but there's also great variances in the industry. It's the publishing industries in all these languages. Um, how do you approach that? Again, in a similar vein, is, do you try to make a, a bridge between editors or publishing houses and agents or other publishers in your markets? Um, is that your role? And, um, you know, it's a, another question. What could editors do to expand their networks into some of these markets where they might not have existing contacts? <laughs> well, I'm trying to sneak an agent into the Amazon Crossing party tomorrow night. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, we definitely um, can act as a bridge between other parts of the publishing world and, and introduce publishers to other publishers, yeah. certainly, yeah, I think, I, I know I do that. Yeah, I mean, if, if uh, I think of it, actually very few Chinese writers have agents, more do now than before, which is why the translator has to do such a lot of bridge building. If, if, uh, if an author has an agent, that's kind of half the work done. Mm -hmm. And that is, after all, their, their special mm -hmm. area of expertise. So that always makes me very happy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think as translators, everybody here knows that you're pretty much the gateway to the literature that you're representing. Um, so I think our role is crucial. Yeah. yeah. Even more so when there aren't literary agents. Okay. It's not necessarily books that we're pitching for ourselves that we want to translate. We're often matching mm. things up for other translators or just trying to put the big pieces of the pieces of the big jigsaw puzzle together. Yeah. So yeah. 
Yeah, that actually segs nicely into my next question um, about you know one of the ways Amazon Crossing has been excited to try and support translation in underrepresented languages is to sponsor um, the Alta Emerging Translator Mentorship Program, which pairs an emerging, up and coming translator with a more experienced translator. And I know that many of you are involved in similar mentorship programs. So I'm just curious, you know, how can translators work with other translators to promote? translations of under underrepresented languages or gain visibility for them? Uh, well, I find that a relatively easy question to answer because, I mean, that is one of the things that we do on Paper Republic uh, because we're known for posting short stories. We often get would-be translators sending us short stories saying, will you post this for us? <laughs> And one thing that we do, so this is pretty informal and ad hoc, is to always edit if we accept a short story. All that we ask is that the translator should have um, contacted the author and got permission. But after that, we're prepared to do a proper edit so that uh, that whole editing process is part of our mentoring. If anybody, if any translator asks me for help on anything, I'm assuming I have time, I'm more than willing to do it. So that's a rather informal way of doing it. We also are going to try and do um, something rather more structured, uh, uh, a kind of uh, translator training project. Um, it's obviously very important to help new translators come up because one of the things I remember from 10, 15 years ago is that the um, publishers would always wail that they couldn't find the translators. And I found this quite infuriating and I wanted to say, look, look, well, apart from anything else, there's me here. <laughs> and all right, I'll find you some others. So, that is now l a less common complaint because publishers know where to find Chinese to English translators. So I think to a certain extent, uh, as a loose group of uh, translators, we've been successful in mentoring other translators. I think it's really crucially important. Um, I'm one of the mentors for the Writers' Centre Norwich Emerging Translator Programme. Um, I've done this for the past six years and it's the most luxurious way to teach. You have a mentee, as we call them, for want of any other word, <laughs> for six months and you work together and really it's an opportunity to help somebody else to identify the books that they might want to translate. So you can, what I usually do is go to Poland with them and go into bookshops and just talk about books and take them to meet publishers and help them f to see what's there. Show them all the right websites and all the right publishing houses to be looking at and all the right reviews to be looking at so that they can just get their cogs moving and find the things that really excite them. And then I help them by teaching them to prepare those materials I talked about and teaching them how to identify those publishers to pitch to and all those things that you need to know. And you've got a lovely whole six months to learn how to do that instead of oh, an hour's panel. Um, and I know it's a luxury. No, nothing to add. Okay, great. Well, I want to make sure that we leave time for a question and answer session, but um, I will ask one more question, kind of big one. Um, what do you think of the future? Are you seeing trends now that you think are promising and are actively leading to greater diversity in publishing and in translation, or uh, do we still have a long way to go? I think the future for Arabic literature and translation is very bright. I mean, currently this year, um, Jonathan's write, Jonathan Wright's translation was shortlisted for the, has it been? No, sorry. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. For the Man Booker um, Prize. And that's, I mean, granted, the prize is re relatively new, the new one. But that's the first time we've ever had an Arabic translation on that list. 
also just in terms of the community of Arabic uh, translators has really grown and I just feel very supported by you know all of my colleagues and I think when I started 10 years ago I didn't really know anybody and I wasn't sure can you make a career of this like how you know how, how to go about it and so it's just really exciting I think right now that there is like a surge of people working from Arabic into English that I'm aware of and um, it's just yes yeah, a very exciting time yeah. <laughs> Um, yes, things are improving, and yes, we have a long way to go. <laughs> <laughs> yes to everything. When I started translating, there were maybe in one year uh, three works translated from Chinese to English, and now it's between 20, 30, wow. loads of children's books. So, and, and I think one of the most important things is that uh, Chinese writers, although still many of them don't speak any English, they are beginning to learn how the publishing world works. Mm -hmm. So their expectations are now more realistic. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important. Um, compared with when I started, which is almost 30 years ago, it is just totally and utterly different. The turnaround is Im amazing. And Polish has just in the last couple of years really started to take off. And it's just the most exciting feeling in the world, for instance, that the very successful Polish novelist Olga Tokarczuk has a book on the Man Booker International long list this year. I've spent 18 years trying to get some attention to that author. And finally, we've done it. It's like I feel like we've won already. It's fantastic. And there's a huge amount now happening around Polish. And uh, there's all sorts of factors that have helped. Just all the activism of translators in this country and in the United States who've done such a huge amount to change the whole image of, of translated literature. There's lots of people here who are responsible for that. And then um, just things like having Poland as the market focus country here last year, that was very, very helpful. And immense efforts in Poland. I think the, the Polish Book Institute is hugely responsible for the turnaround in our particular case. And we've got a great future ahead. What a good note to end on. Um, well, thank you all so much. And with that, we will open it up to questions. There is a microphone coming, I think. Hello. There it yes. goes. <laughs> right. Um, I was interested in what you said about uh, collaborating with the author for pitching. Uh, we can't hear you. Ah. I was interested in what you said about collaborating with the author when pitching, um, because I'm trying to pitch a book at the moment. I mean, my, my first book of literary fiction. Um, and uh, speaking to the uh, publisher, I've you know, asked her if um, she has mentioned anything to the author and she said, no, no, she wouldn't want to do that because she wouldn't want to get the author's hopes up. Um, and, you know, the publisher is my way of getting in contact with the author if necessary. So I've kind of accepted that, but I don't know what you think about that. So from my experience, I've never had the, the actual, the publisher contact the author prior to commissioning the book. And in terms of the author's role, when I'm pitching, it's more so only with regards to the sample translation that I've presented to them. Uh, and so if they have, their, they're not really um, giving any other sort of input, whether it be, you know, we should go to this publisher or no. how about publishing only in the U U US, etc. It's solely just their input on the translation that I have. Yeah, been. this is the French publisher I'm talking about, you know, the original publisher. Ah, okay, so yeah. you're asking if the original publisher in the source language should let the author know yeah. that their yes. work will be pitched? Yes, and the, which, which they don't want to do. Oh, mm. I think that's quite odd then, right? Because it's, it's, the author should know that their work is being presented to other publishing houses. I mean, they might have some connections. Um, or you know a particular house they want to work with. I'm always mm. willing to listen to the author, but I don't think you should cut them out from from the get go and mm. and just 
work in isolation. I don't think that's a good idea because if anything, the author will be able to give you more information about the book. If you've done a reader's report, they can look over and say, actually, no, I think you know, maybe you should focus on this part. And it's a discussion. You don't have to take on everything that they've said, but I think as the author, they have the right and, yeah. and deserve to be aware of what's happening. Mm. Yeah. But I, d I don't know. I just have the feeling if I if I tried to do that, I might get the pu you know the French publishers back up. And <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I mean, how it works in in France, to be honest. Um, I, I, maybe the publishing etiquette is a bit different. Mm. Uh, I mean, obviously mm. we don't work from French, but yeah, mm. I'm not I'm not sure, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank Sorry. you. Um, in the case, for instance, of my Ukrainian author, Jana Swaniowska, who writes in Polish, early on I did get in touch with her. Obviously, you have to contact whoever holds the rights first, and that may, that's more likely to be the publisher. Sometimes it's the author. But I did say to her, you, you mentioned that you were worried about getting their hopes up um, and then not getting them a publisher. Um, I was very clear to her that I didn't know if I was going to succeed or not, and I asked her to be very, very patient. Mm -hmm. And part of why I involved her was because I, well, I was a bit concerned that other translators might want to do it, and I kind of wanted to ring-fence it a bit. <laughs> but um, uh, I, think, I think it's a good idea to involve them, in fact. She was very, very helpful to me and encouraging, um, and uh, luckily was patient. Great. Okay, thanks. I think we have a question right here in the front. Thank you very much. Uh, can, oh, thank you very much. Um, I was thinking of um, cultural gatekeepers in the literary marketplace, and I'm looking at two parts here. How does Amazon Crossing view itself as being different from the giants, the traditional giants, and what role do you um, see yourselves in in terms of the cultural flow mm -hmm. how do, what, are, what are the objectives and are they different and in terms of translators do you feel that the do you initialize the cultural flow or do the publishers and who has a stronger impact because listening to all three of you it seemed like you were choosing the texts that you, that, that, that spoke to you as individuals and then taking them to the publishers. So do you feel that the flow begins with the translator? Thank you. Great. We can read the language. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, to the question about Amazon Crossing, I'll say you know, I'm, I'm somewhat hesitant to compare us to other publishers because we, from our perspective, we really start from readers and from authors and translators. And our focus is entirely on um, you know, which books have distinguished themselves in their own markets and which books might English readers love. So that, that's our starting point. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think um, it's a, it, that's, that's our strategy. So um, I don't know, the translators in terms of the, tra the, the cultural flow, did you have any? Uh, I mean, in an ideal world, we wouldn't have to be choosing our own favy books and spending a lot of time trying to find a publisher for them. In an ideal world, the publisher would find their books through the agent, through having read about the author and so on. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think doing the gatekeeper role is, is inevitable, but it's not ideal. The more publishers get to know about our particular um, language, literature, the better, because then, then they ask us, they give us a contract, which is lovely. <laughs> Great. Okay. I think, oh, there's a question right here in front. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Earlier, I heard someone mention the idea of working with the author to edit the text before pitching it to the, to the publisher. I think it's a really fascinating idea, and I was wondering if you could speak more about what particular insights you had in reading the text when thinking about the target marketplace, and how did you approach the author about making those suggested edits? Oh, I, I was going to ask you to actually give us examples <laughs> about that particular okay. exercise. Right, so um, this has happened to me with crime novels where sometimes there will be um, extremely, well, 
in jokes isn't the right phrase, but fairly esoteric facts that people in Poland are much more likely to know. At the moment, I'm translating a book set in 1890s Krakow, and it's very carefully researched, but it is essentially a crime novel. But it's full of facts taken out of newspapers of the period. It's full of things like the weights and measures used in Austria, Hungary, um, and lots and lots of details of life in Krakow in the period. There are real people who appear in it in sort of pastiche forms, and a huge amount of research has gone into it. And there's a, a, a large element of detail there that will be very familiar to a Polish reader, because Poland is quite a sort of self-focused country, quite, she said, very, <laughs> um, where everybody knows the same cultural references. But to, to people here, those are just meaningless. So what I'm doing, luckily, the authors, it, it so it's the name of a woman, but it's actually two guys who are the authors, hiding behind the name of a made-up woman, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is quite funny. I'm hoping she'll be entered for all the women's prizes. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I, they are both, as well as writers, they're translators. So they know exactly where I'm coming from. And I've been sending it to them chapter by chapter with comments down the side of my translation saying, do you think here perhaps we could change this? Can you think of something that would be more familiar across Europe? And so they're helping me. And then sometimes we're thinking, nah, we'll let them look that up. They can suffer here and find <laughs> out something new. But we are actually editing together. As I go through the translation, I'm working with them and thinking about that English language market where all those things are going to be lost and it'll just bore and alienate the reader if we leave all of that detail. So, for instance, Thank you. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? We have time for another question or two. Uh, just here. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask your views on co-translation and any experience you have of it. Yeah, that's a nice one. Uh, I like co-translation, but it, I do need to have faith in my fellow translator. I, I, I think one of the problems with Chinese to English is that it is so different. Uh, the two languages are so different that um, you really do have to recreate the language as you go through. Therefore, if you get two translators with very different styles, um, this can be a problem. However, a series, a collection of short stories I'm doing at the moment I was very happy to co-translate for the reason that <coughs> I know she's good. I've actually translated a long short story, a very short novella with her, and I defy anyone to see where her bit ended and my bit began. So providing we... Oh, and also it's nice to know that they have similar approaches to deadlines. So, you know, if, are you going to get it in the neck because she hasn't finished her bit? So, yes, in principle, absolutely. Yes, yeah. So, my experience with co translation is I'm currently working on a um, young adult uh, book, and I had never done co translation before. And this is a friend of mine who also translates from Arabic. But the way that we started is I translated one chapter and she edited it. And then she translated the other chapter and I edited it. But we didn't use that. We then redid it um, where we each came at it from our own angles and merged them, if that makes sense. So it was a kind of a familiarity exercise, me getting to know why she's made these choices. She's asking me, why did I, you know, change this verb tense, etc. So we had that as a kind of dry run. And now we both are, you know, co-translating um, the rest in, in the hope of yeah pitching it so it, it did take some time and I think we definitely have different approaches but it's not impossible but it, it really does take a lot more time I find when you're working with someone as opposed to just doing it on your own but I think it's made me a better translator in the process yeah um, I'm much too bossy and egotistical to co-translate <laughs> but it's very useful for mentoring 
And um, for instance, Zosha, who's here with us, um, we worked together on a children's novel where essentially she did all the hard work because she translated it chapter by chapter. And then I edited each chapter partly as a way of helping her to hone her translation techniques. Um, so it can be a very useful tool for mentoring and then you have a, a lovely product at the end of it. Great. And with that, I'm afraid that we are out of time. So Nikki, Sawad, and Antonia, thank you so much again. And thank you all for coming.